Welcome to Let's Talk Human Behavior. You know, we're all many things, but the one truth is we are the person our behavior defines us as. The real truth about our life is behavior never lies. This is the essence of whom we are, what we believe, and the definition of the pathway we walk. You know, in that walk through life, you're writing a book about you. Your life is about adventure. It's about challenge. It's about pain. It's about lessons. And it's about experiences. Put all these together and they paint the canvas of our life. On Let's Talk Human Behavior, I love sharing the lives of people with you. Since all of us are a book being created, it allows others who share in our world an opportunity to learn from where we've been. Even though all of us are an original, we're all connected through the experiences of life. I've known my guest today, and we were just sitting here figuring it out. And I've known my guest for basically 36 years. Yet as much as I know about him, I also don't know about him. This I do know. His presence has a presence that's present, even though we've been disconnected for several years now. One lesson I learned is those who have a powerful presence in your life never leave your life. The gentleman I want you to meet today is Rick Hill. And I've asked Rick to share his story with you because it's a story that many of us can connect to. And Rick, I want to welcome you today to Let's Talk Human Behavior. Uh, thank you. You're welcome, Richard. I'm glad to be here. Uh, of course, I'm glad to be talking with you again. Uh, it was the, the death of a close friend of ours that brought us together uh, this time. But uh, you and I traveled a lot when I was working for you at Richard Flint Seminars, I don't know how many miles you, of course, traveled more than all of us put together, but it was fun. I mean, <laughs> some of the antics we pulled on the road were fun, and some of them we talk about, and some of them we don't. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and I mean that in a conservative Christian sense. Yeah, we, uh, we were just sitting here talking about uh, some of the stories of you know, of Rick getting lost in the tunnels in Toronto and <laughs> the fear of never finding him again. If you've ever been to Toronto and you've been down in the underground tunnels, uh, this, this shopping mall underground, it's amazing. You can get lost down there and never find your way back. And us leaving the, the hotel there in Toronto and I pick up his suitcase and it's light. And I say, Rick, I said, this suitcase seems light. And then you realize you'd never packed any of your clothes <laughs> out of the dresser drawers in the room. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I can find the seat of my pants with both hands and a flashlight. You know, <laughs> how have I gotten through life? Uh, we'll talk about a little of that, uh, how I got through life. Uh, but it, it's good to be here. And I'd love to share my story with your uh, viewers. Uh, it's a story that I think needs to be told. And I'm glad that uh, that you are willing to do that. And let's get it started. We're Tell ready. us your story, Rick. Okay. Uh, the story actually begins back in New Ulm, Minnesota. I was living in the land of the snow. Um, had graduated Bible college and uh, was the principal of the New Ulm Christian School. And you're snickering because <laughs> how did Rick gets to be a principal. So there were two students, right? <laughs> no, we had more than that. It, it was really a good ministry. We took all the troubled kids that were kicked out of school or were never going to graduate or, you know, and we wrote letters to the state and we said, we'll take them and we'd like to get a little assistance. And we graduated, we had, we had about 60 kids and we graduated most of them early. Most of them went on to college. So, you know, there was a raison d'etre involved in all that. We were helping them. And uh, that got me on that trail. 
and then I got married and about the, the first year I was married, I discovered a tumor. I won't tell you where it was, but I couldn't do a lot of horseback riding during that period of time, if that's a clue for you. And so I went in and, you know, they, well, we'll give you antibiotics. Blah, 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 blah. I wound up at the Mayo Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, Richard, you know, Citadel of Modern Medicine. And it is impressive. If, if they're going to meet you for an appointment at four o'clock, the sweep hand is coming around the clock. Mr. Hill, come on in. <laughs> I mean, it is an OCD dream come true. I'm telling you now. And so I was there uh, about a month, maybe a month and a half or so. Uh, I, they diagnosed me with stage three, although that's debatable because the kind of cancer I had, there was no stage four classification, but it was in my lymphatic system. And I, they operated on my feet, they found it. They operated on my neck, they found it. So I think it's pretty fair to say that it was systemic. So radiation was out. You can't radiate your whole body. So they were going to start me out on chemotherapy, actinomycin D, which is a lot like battery acid. And, you know, I thought about it. But then a friend of mine wrote me a letter and said, do you want to live? Now, that's a guy who's been a counselor for a while. huh? He didn't say, let me tell you how to live. He first said, asked, do you want to live? And I thought, uh oh, he knows what he's doing. I better watch how I answer this. I said, yes, I do. He said, then you got to leave the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> I'm wondering who's listening to this conversation. And I said, and where would you like me to go? Right now I'm being, you know, sarcastic. He said, are you sitting down? I said, yes. He said, Tijuana, Mexico. <laughs> I said, yeah. Okay, fine. Are you not feeling well today? Do you need, I mean, are you off your meds? What is going on? No, I'm not leaving the Mayo Clinic and go to Tijuana, Mexico. I don't want chiclets. I don't drink tequila. I mean, come on. He said, I'm telling you, they have clinics down there. I'm one in particular I'm thinking of that understands the human body like the Mayo Clinic does not. They're not into drugs. They're medical doctors, they can prescribe drugs, they can give painkillers, but they seldom do that. What they do is try and discover why you got cancer. It's called functional medicine. And I thought, huh. So I called the chemotherapist at Mayo and I said, how many people could you have me call? I've taken my kind of chemotherapy that you want me to take with my kind of cancer. I'll wait. He said, I'd have to check the records. <laughs> and I said, look, let me cut to the chase. I'm thinking about boogieing out of here. You don't think that chemotherapy is really going to help me, do you? He went, it's tough. I said, what about Mexico? He said, it's nice and warm down there. <laughs> That's what he said. It is warm in Tijuana this time of year. It's cold in Minnesota. So I said, all right, I think I'm going to go. And he was okay with that. My surgeon was not. Then my family had flown into town to say goodbye. It was that far along. About a couple of months I had, maybe a month. And, you know, everybody was gathered and they're crying. And my older brother wanted to know well, who gets to watch and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I said, I'm thinking about leaving Mayo and going to Tijuana. And I'm telling you, Bedlam. My family's a little demonstrative. You've probably picked up on that over the years. Yes. And I'm telling you, screaming, gnashing of teeth, ripping of clothes. <laughs> my brother, Sam Hill, if you can believe that combo, said, if you leave the Mayo Clinic, I will never speak to you again. I said, Sam, if I don't leave the Mayo Clinic, you're never going to speak to me again. I won't be here. And that was a compliment of the evening. So my father-in-law, after my family had nervous breakdowns, he said, you know what? I like the idea. 
I'll go with him and I'll help him pay for it. Well, my family looked at their shoes. <laughs> when you start talking money, <laughs> okay, you take care of it less. <laughs> You and he, you and Rick, go ahead. You know, it is warm. So to make the story shrink, I left. And we went down to Tijuana and I was in Wonderland. I'm talking, I went down the rabbit hole. I grew up in Detroit. I was a greaser. And I don't mean gross point kind of Detroit. Uh there was no golf courses in my neighborhood. There are no tennis courts in my neighborhood and there were no health food stores, guaranteed. <laughs> I'd never been in a health food store. I didn't know what an avocado was. We ate a lot of, a lot of dinners at McDonald's. And so I got down there and they said, there's a couple of things you need to do. We have a lady that's got a little ministry where she takes you to health food stores and helps you select the foods that you're going to be eating. I thought, does she know who I am? You know, I'm like the Fonz. And she, and so this lady takes me and she goes, yes, no, she's a military lady. They call her Soldier Burford. Yes, no, yes, no. And I'm taking notes, you know. I was the only person in that store wearing underwear. This was stone ground hippie land. You know, they're playing Ravi Shanker music in the background. I'm fresh off the Baptist church. Okay, so what are you going to do? And I, I was eating things that I normally wouldn't even step in. I mean, this, I did not, I did not blend. Let's put it that way. Then they said, you're also going to be taking a series of colonics. Now, for those of you that don't know what a colonic is, let me just in a professional way, picture yourself water skiing really fast. And then I just want you to sit down. <laughs> That's what a colonic is. <laughs> I said, I don't, to the lady that wanted to do it, I'm sitting in my chair, I wouldn't want to get near, you know. I says, can you describe this a little bit? And she says, well, have you ever changed the water in the radiator of your car? I guess I look like a gearhead. I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. You undo the thing, you put the garden nose in there, undo the comes out all black, and then and then, then you cap it back up and lay rubber out of the parking lot. She goes, Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we're gonna change the water in your system. I said, where does the hose go? Can <laughs> <laughs> you give me a diagram here? I had an idea because of the name of the on the door. So I started a series, Richard, not one, not two, but a series of colonics. So I'm eating this food that is mostly tasteless. I'm doing colonics, I'm taking supplements. I'm, but it all came to a head for me. And I want this to be the curve in the road for your listeners and your viewers. When I said to myself, am I real? I was 24 years old. That was 48 years ago. And I walked to the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. You know, the clinic is two blocks off the beach. And I walked in the water about to my knees. And um, I asked myself a question. And the question was, is this life worth saving? Because if I don't do anything, I'm going to die soon. But if I do what they wanted me to do, <laughs> I got to be a different person. But I'm willing to do that if I can honestly say I can make a contribution and offer people hope if I live. And I define hope as helping other people escape. And I've done that for 45 years now. So I answered the question, yes, I can. Yes, I'm worth saving. And if that's true, and you said it best, Richard, in the introduction, you said, you, you can't argue with, with what you do. That's the testimony of your life. You can say anything, but what you do is where you get 
clobbered. And so I said, in a word of prayer, in the water, I said, if you want me to mow the lawn with my teeth, I will ask you, how long do you want that cut? I'm not going to argue about it. I don't want to eat green, squishy things. I don't want to, that, 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 that. I'm just going to put the blinders on and do what you tell me. And when I left there, I weighed 122 pounds. Now, I'm not a big guy. I probably weighed 150, 60 when I was traveling with you. I got down to 122 pounds. And I'm talking, I was like a praying mantis. <laughs> you know, that's skinny. But here's the deal. I felt good. And I would... I did. I felt good. And my cancer tests all went to zero. Mayo Clinic diagnosed for the guy who goes, oh, he's lying. He never had it in the first place. That's all, you know. Yes, I did. And my slides are, are preserved in paraffin because I was lecturing a couple months after I got home and a guy stood up and he said, I defy you to prove you had cancer. I think you're lying about this. So I wrote the Mayo Clinic, overnighted this letter and said, uh, unless you can you know, show me within 24 hours, I'm gonna file a lawsuit. And here's the attorney, it was a guy in our church, you know, easy to do. And they wrote back, man, they wrote back. They said, your slides are now preserved in paraffin forever. We never take those away. Any medical doctor can look and see your slides. No, you had it, pal. You had it everywhere. So I came home and I stayed on that restricted diet and program for five years. You know, not when you knew me. Uh, I still, we never went to McDonald's that I recall. We weren't eating that kind of food. Uh, but five years I did this program. And then I threw it all in a book. Uh, that uh, can, you can get on Amazon. It's called the Cancer Conundrum. Uh, big print, <laughs> lots of pictures. <laughs> Richard would go. I see Rick Hill wrote this book. <laughs> I can read this in about a half hour. Um, but let me show you a quick photo while we're doing show and tell. Uh, this is what I looked like at the mail. You got too much light here at the Mayo Clinic. And then a little while later, when I was at Ann Wigmore's Hippocrates, learning how to juice and those things, that's a picture of me at about 118 pounds. And five of those pounds were my hair, as you politely <laughs> did not point out. So it's a real story, Richard. You can have me checked out. Uh, but let's talk about things I learned. Because my story, I took Laetrile, that's not news anymore. Lots of people get over uh, terminal cancer through nutrition these days. The only reason my story resonated with people, it was new. Very few people did what I did then, back then. And that's why it was big news. But that still, I learned a lot. Here are some of the lessons. I never set goals. Uh, remember, I got sick in 74. The first year I set goals was 1976. That's my goals written out in 1976. That's the organic Chablis, <laughs> the goal book. Uh, so every year since then, I have set goals. I don't accomplish a lot of my goals. Because as you pointed out, I get lost a lot. But Here's the thing. If you've got something that pulls you back on course, you know, I can look at it and go, ah, that's what I wanted. And those are the three ways I was going to get it. So, okay, didn't work out like I thought, but let me get back in the game. And that has been very helpful to me for all these years. So, goals are an affirmation. You're the wordsmith, Richard. Goals are an affirmation of hope. Hopeless people don't set goals because they don't care. 
They don't think they'll make it. They don't think they'll be alive to do it. So the one thing I notice when people start to get well from significant illnesses is they start to dream again. I forgot your definition of dream, but I liked it. <laughs> uh, it isn't just words, it's actions. And that's what I see returning like water onto a parched piece of ground. They dream again. They say, you know, I've always wanted to do that. that, that, that. I think I'm going to write that out and borrow some money and get it done. Where before they were just totally consumed with their illness. So I would say to you, not you, your listeners, if you're struggling with something, have you lost your dreams? Because that's going to be part of your healing. Bring all that back. Plan for the future. And I do it every year, written and plastered on the wall every year without fail. So that's what I learned. Number two, my older brother, Roger, said to me when I was really in that five-year strict eating period, he said to me, I'd rather be dead than live like you. I said, other than that, Raj, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Crying out loud, Raj. You know, you'd rather be dead than be me. I said, I got a lot to live for, man. I got kids. Now I've got grandkids and two ugly dogs. You know, why would you feel that way? But it was during that time that he said, well, I want to eat what I want to eat. And I want something that's messing with it. And I want it. I said, all right, try this, Raj. Eat half of what you normally eat. Half. If you normally eat a whole sandwich, see if you can survive with half sandwich. If you do, 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 do because I maintain my weight all these years. And one time I ballooned up pretty quickly, Richard, to 185. Now that doesn't seem like a lot to a lot of people, but for a guy built like me, 185, I look like Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> so I'm telling you, I have to keep a governor on things. And so anytime I sit down, I look at a plate of food, I envision this wall between the plate and, the, and I move it over and I go, that's mine. That we save for leftovers. I'll eat half of it. That's a good plan. Um, everyone already knows what they should and shouldn't eat or drink. You can't set somebody down and go, potato chips, yes or no? <laughs> and they have them go, yes. <laughs> now, they taste good, I'll give you that. But most people will go, all right, I can have a few chips once in a while, but it's not a good idea. Um, you know, whiskey sours every night, yes. <laughs> No, I think most thoughtful people would go, it, it dehydrates you. It's, you know, you, sometimes you make bad decisions after you've had a couple of those. So no, I think that comes under the no column. People already know they aren't motivated, Richard. They're not setting goals. They're not focused on a tomorrow. They're focused on right now. I'm only two miles from the local bar. Watch this, <laughs> we're on our way. Instead of how does that affect my future? What am I working for? What am I living for? Is this life worth saving? I'd like to tell you that it is. I'm going to my daughter's tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna do smoothies in the morning. Then we're going to see Top Gun. And I would have missed all that. She's got three beautiful daughters. I would have missed all that. Uh, going to see my son in the third week of July in Anchorage, Alaska. Okay, not all my kids are bright, okay. <laughs> but uh, actually he's a dentist and he's doing well, but here's the point. I, I would have missed all that. He's got three kids. Gone, no goals. And, and I don't, I don't want to be that guy. Uh, Richard, I'd like to think 10 years from today, we could do this again. And I would say to you, hey, here's the things I accomplished 
between the day we had that little video and today because I'm still on track. I'm still worth saving. I still got things written out. And, and yeah, I goof up. Can't find my seat of my pants with both hands and a flashlight. Never have been the smartest guy in the room. So what? So what? We're okay. People need us. And I want to offer people hope. Helping other people escape. That's the story, Richard. Well, you know, Rick, I think there, there are so many uh, lessons in here uh, because of the fact that I, I don't think most people really live. I think they, they approach every day to survive. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, when someone tells me uh, I'm a survivor, you know, what I want to tell them is you've given up. Because yeah. survivor lives from moment to moment. That's and, exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, in your story, I, I, I kept hearing, you know, it was like when you were standing in the water, uh, knee deep in the water. Uh, is my work, is my life worth living? Saving. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think most people never ask that question. <laughs> Because or they're afraid of the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody would really miss me, you know. Well, and I I think that's to to me, that's the real definition of loneliness. Is that you walk in a space where no one misses you. <laughs> because I think most of us spend our life hiding from ourselves. Well, you said it best. When I was working with you, the number one thing a human life wants to know is that they matter. Yeah. That's that's it. Well, and you know, your your emphasis on uh, on hope. That's one of the things, Rick, I see missing in our country today. Maybe. Is that we've taken hope away from people. Yep. And you know, how do you get hope back? How do you help people rebuild hope when it seems that's like what, that's what you do? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and again, it goes back and, you know, years ago, we talked about this and I keep talking, emphasizing it today. How many people really ever use anything that I teach? 2%. Really? 2%. And it, it you know, if I sit down and really uh, ponder on that, it, it makes me sad, <laughs> but you know, it was like the guy that that stood up and said, "You know, you've never had cancer." Yeah, right. Yeah. Didn't fit his narrative. Yeah, because most of us want to hear things that we agree with, not things that make us think about what we're saying. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and when you do that, when you take hope away, um. You take so many things out of the human life. I mean, a person without hope has to live in yesterday. Yeah, the glory days. Yeah, you know, and you know, you and I have heard these people. They sit around and talk about what their life has been, right? Not what their life is going to become, because their their life has lost purpose. And well, you, know, you taught me that when I was around you as much as I was in the eighties, because I always wondered why does Richard get out of bed at five o'clock when he doesn't have to, our flight doesn't leave until that, that, that. And you were excited about what you were doing. So you slept as little as you could. And then you were out of bed taking notes. I'd walk down to the coffee shop and you'd be sitting there writing in your ledger and doing, and I think he looks at life a little differently than I do. You know, I'm excited to be here, but not that excited. <laughs> so you've mastered that element where you do what you have to do to make the biggest impact. Well, if, you know, if you could walk around the house here, you'd find that in three places in the house that there's, there's little notes and they all say the same thing. 
and I look at them every day. And it, it's part of what feeds my passion for what I do. And that is somebody's going to need me today. <laughs> yeah. And that drives me, Rick. And, you know, I, some days in my life, that person that needs me today is me. <laughs> because sometimes we can get so involved in trying to help others we forget about the importance of helping ourselves, And especially at this time of life. I mean, I'm 71. Um, I was unaware of the challenges of what older age was like. As, as good as I eat and all the things that I do, my systems are breaking down slowly. <laughs> uh, and I go into a grocery store. I don't see how they get from the store to the car. You know, I mean, these people are just damaged. And, and I think, golly, you know, um, I want to get them into a seminar. <laughs> you know, because if they could just get a, a snapshot of themselves physically healed, probably first, and then emotionally healed, secondly, and then occupationally healed, they're thinking, they're thinking, I'm a big disappointment because I'm not retired and golfing all day. <laughs> I wouldn't golf if you gave me the clubs, the balls, and the membership. If, if you're a golfer and you're listening, you go ahead and hate me. I'm just saying it doesn't do anything for me. You know, it just doesn't. And people just, they, they, feel, they get to feeling guilty because they're not. And I'm suggesting helping other people can be a more driving, motivating force than what can I do to entertain myself today? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I study the human life and I study people. And I, I come back to understand that most people are lost and that they lack a direction for their life. So every day they just have to wander through whatever time they have. So, you know, th they don't have a purpose and they're lost because they're organized to continue the crisis in their life. Mm -hmm. And they don't seek ways to get back. They talk about wanting to improve and they talk about what they want to do with their life. But when you study their behavior, it's just not there. And then they, they spend their time staring at what's wrong with their life. And, uh, you know, you can live through the front windshield or you can live through the rear view mirror. Yeah, right. And then the, the last thing, and this is the thing that, that gets me, and I think it's one of the things that's being used against people today. They don't think. You know, a lot of people don't have any common sense. <laughs> so if someone was to ask you, Rick, what does life mean to you? How would you answer that? Life means to me, probably post-cancer experience, that I can make a difference. And that because I was here, someone else's life, not mine, someone else's life was a little easier a little more fun uh, and more exciting, meaningful. So I want to see myself reflected in the eyes of other people. I'm not six feet tall. I'm not drop dead handsome. I'm not, a, I'm not an athlete. Uh, probably didn't do too well in school. <laughs> they pushed me ahead every year because I made them laugh. Uh, but I still see that shine in other people's eyes after I've been around them. Uh, Jane Gordon used to say, I can always tell when Ken's been away with Rick because he comes home in a good mood. And I think that's what we want to do. We want to be, we want to offer people hope. We want to show them this was a good idea to be here. You know? 
instead of, oh, it's going to be five o'clock pretty soon. Then I'm going to go to the bar. And then I'm going to get up tomorrow and do the same thing all over again. They're already dead. They're just waiting to be buried. Yeah, one of my one of my jokes that I because I actually told a, 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 one of my coaching students one day, what you need to do is you need to go down to the local funeral home and buy a, uh, a casket, take it home and replace your bed with the casket, and that every night just crawl in there because you're already dead. <laughs> Because you have you have no purpose for your life, you have no direction, and every day you you live from the outside in, not the inside out. And the more you and I live from the outside in, the less of a life we have, because we become an actor in someone else's play, and they write the script, they give us the script, and we regurgitate the script. But when you can learn the power of living from the inside out where you have that belief, you have that trust and that faith in yourself, and you believe I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I listened to you talk about that, that question you asked yourself when you were standing there in the water, you know, you had to, you asked yourself, really, do you want to live? Yeah. And you could have said no. I was close. Yeah. Because I wasn't, I didn't blend with that world. And I knew that it was going to take a certain amount of, I don't want to do this. But I said, if they're right, then I can live. And well, they were right. And I'm alive 48 years now. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned is I believe that you can, you can experience the life you really put on this earth to have if you can deal with five questions in life. And when I was listening to your story, uh, I could hear you going through this. What do you really want? Not what do you want, but what do you really want? Really want. That's your point. Yeah. And the word is really. I mean, you talk to a lot of people, they'll tell you what they want, but they're lacking that word of commitment. What yeah. do you really want? And then the, the second question, why do you really want this? I mean, why do you want that? And, and then those two questions are the two, per, are the two personal questions. And then you get into the two questions of commitment. You know, are you willing to pay the price to achieve that? And that's where I find most people break down. Because there's a price tag to everything in life. And then the, the fourth question, what behaviors will you have to improve in order to achieve that? I mean, when you went to Tijuana and that, and that lady took you shopping, uh, <laughs> there, there were some choices that had to be made there. And it meant changing your behavior. Yeah. Yep, I threw a few of her smoothies in the planter. <laughs> and, and then the fifth question I think is the is the ultimate question uh, in making choices. Will this decision feed my confusion or strengthen my clarity? And will this, this decision, act, what? Will this feed my confusion? Oh, feed. Or strengthen my clarity. And the sad thing about that, Rick is I found over the years that if you ask that to 10 people, seven of them will choose confusion. Because we get, in, we get into this routine of life, and we think it's life, and it's not. It's existence. And, you know, you're to me are a living de demonstration of my my three days of life. You had the desire, mm -hmm. or you never walked out of mail. Yeah, that was tough because you were you were in you were in the citadel of medicine. Yeah, nowhere to go. Yep, but you had a desire that I want to live, and, and then you were determined. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, going to Tijuana, which is not like going to Las Vegas, um, going to Tijuana was determination. But it went back to the thing because, you know, and I don't know if you still have it, but I remember the, the book you wrote, uh, Too Young to Die. Yeah, this is the, uh, it's an upgrade, but it's the same story. Yeah, but, you know, I, I remember the first time I heard you tell your story. And, you know, you, you have to want not to live. You, had a, you have to want to have a life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then to put those two Ds together, none of it will work if you don't have the discipline. Yeah. Right. And I would imagine <laughs> that Tijuana was a, a real test to discipline. Well, back in 1974, it was a bit more rustic <laughs> than it is that's a, today. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the Mexican people saved my life. And there's some beautiful, beautiful people down there. But it's also a very rough place in a lot of ways. Dangerous. A couple more things before we bring this to a close. When, when you talk about goals, mm -hmm. what is a goal? I, I think that's such an, an interesting word we throw out there in the world of, you know, helping people success. We keep talking about you got to have goals. So people sit there and they ponder and they go, okay, I want to make a million dollars. What's a goal? For me, it's all about activity goals. Okay. Um, because I'm so I'm so bad at getting the end goal, you know, whatever the prize is, that I always hold myself responsible to do certain. I say to myself, is this a, a worthy goal to want to be here in another 12 months or sometimes five years, but 12 months? Yes, I think that's a worthy goal. Okay. How do you get there? What are you gonna do on Monday? What are you gonna to do Tuesday? What are you gonna give up that you're currently doing and not doing those things? So for me, activity goals are the heart of accurate goal setting, not wishful thinking. You know, it's, it's, a, it's the equivalent of your five o'clock in the morning writing things down. You're actually doing something, directing your path. At least that's how I interpreted it. And so for me, it isn't, oh yeah, I want a yacht. First of all, I've never set that goal. I don't really want a yacht. But if I did, I would certainly have a game plan to get there. And I'm not gonna set that goal because I don't wanna do those activities. They're, they're not, that doesn't offer people hope a nice boat ride, but it's not my narrative. It's not why this life got saved. Well, what I find is when a lot of people write goals, they write them from their emotions up, not their mind down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, I, I try to help people understand this. If I write something from my emotions up, what I create is a to-do list. But if I work, I organize it from my mind down, I write an achievement list. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. And, you know, we were put on this earth to achieve, not to, not just to do. Um, so you still write goals today? Every year since 1978. I have a book. That's a picture of it. It's in my garage. You want me to prove it i'll put on hold and go get it but it's sitting in my garage <laughs> but i had i just and i probably put it on one page so i don't write a you know big thing but i actually the truth of the matter is i start in about mid-october and i just put a couple of things on the page and set it aside and sometimes if you come back to that mid-november you know what was i thinking you know that's not what i should be doing so it's a process. That's the other thing that I didn't mention. It's a process that takes me about two to three months. And I mean, just a little bit once a week or so. But 
it doesn't gel for me until you get that lull at the end of the year where you've had Christmas and there's a week between Christmas and New Year's. Everyone's wondering, well, what's going to happen next year? Who's going to get elected in November? You know, it's during that lull week that I really start thinking, okay, it's time to crunch some numbers here. But what you'll see is sometimes they get modified. You see the dates? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happened January through July? I changed my mind. But I can do that because it's my life. And it's got to blend with what I think I'm here for. And sometimes I get lost. You know, sometimes I think I sure would like a new Jaguar. Sure would like, and there's nothing wrong with those things. Richard, one year, a, a company for reasons their own paid me a million dollars. I know it's hard for you to look at me and go, Rick. <laughs> yeah, right. Million. And I'm working as hard today as I did then. And I'm, and I'm working, I think, as smart or smarter than I did then. Different circumstances then. Certain people needed what I could do at a time when I could do it. It really wasn't a reflection of me so much. Timing. So when I set these annual activity lists, uh, it, it really challenges me. What can't you do if you do that? Well, you can't watch five hours of TV a day. You can't drink a lot of alcohol. Uh, you can't do something that doesn't bring you closer to that objective. There's a lot of people say, I, I don't talk negative. Don't talk negatives to me, <laughs> I think. I talk to myself all the time. Rick, don't do that. Don't do that. That's a dead end. You can't get here if you stay here. Yeah, it's what I call the circle of sameness. No. But when, when, you're, when you're planning your goals, do, do you plan from like when you, you look at 2023, do you plan your goals from what you haven't achieved or from what you want to achieve? Or is it a combination? I've never been asked that particular question. I think it's more of a reflection during that dull week where I look back and say, was I a good steward during this past 12 months? If that's what the time piece covers. And if I answer no, I say, why is that? Maybe I didn't really buy into it. Maybe I was just putting words on a page. Because if I really believe that to be a worthy uh, direction, I'll set it again. I don't throw it away. I don't feel a high need to come up with something completely new. So you build off of? Yeah. That's how this got set in July. Because I got to July or June and I said, <laughs> I, I can't find my way out of the Grand Old Opry Hotel here. I'm bumping into walls. Now, if you're the kind of guy that's blessed with so much that never happens, that must be a real shocker. For me, not so much. <laughs> I bonk into a wall and go, hello. <laughs> the other thing, and one more thing, and I, I agree with you so much here. When you talk about people already know, they're just not motivated to do anything about it. Yeah. What, what motivates Rick Hill? Offering people hope. Now, I, don't, I don't mean to glibly throw that back at you, but I mean, it's every time I wind up feeling worthless, it's because I strayed from that goal, helping other people escape. I thought more about me. I thought more about having something. I thought more about other than seeing the light reverberate out of somebody's eyes because I'm there, you know? That's what drives me. 
And I think I got my hat on straight with that. I don't always succeed, but I get pulled back because that was such a strong motivation. Yeah, one of the things I see in people is that, and I get asked this question all the time, you know, how did I get here? You know, what did, what did I do wrong? I mean, things were going so good and, and, and then what happened? And what I want people to focus on is that most of the time when you and I get lost or we take a detour, it's because we stopped doing something that we were doing that was keeping us on the right track. Right. And sometimes we get too smart for our own good. <laughs> and, you know, we can get in our own way and trip over our own feet. Yep. A lot. Yeah. If, if people have a question for you, how can they reach you? Um, I'd be happy to give you my email address on the on the tape here i mean yeah i won't get for, like you said only two percent are even listening you know remember that lady that used to make cassette tapes for us i can't think of her name um, oh yeah yeah anyway my prescriptions for effective living or some that album you hooked me up with century 21 there had to be three thousand people in the room i don't know how many albums i sold but to my chagrin I got home and for some reason I thought I'm gonna listen to my own album here. And I put tape one, I put tape two in, it was blank. <laughs> and I sold, I don't know, three or four hundred albums. So I called her in a panic and said, you know, we got 400 blank tapes out there. She said, I will replace any tape that someone calls you about. <laughs> Nobody got to tape two. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of hard to walk through the door like you own the place when you sold some somebody your album, they didn't even listen to it. But my email address at R B, like boy, Hill, H I L L 48 at gmail.com. R B Hill 48. And I'll be happy to answer anybody's email, but you're the guy they should be talking to, Richard. You know, I'm your sidekick. Uh, I've done a couple of things right, but you're the guy that really th thinks this stuff through. Yeah, but Rick, all of us have a story. And I think your story about your desire, your determination, and your discipline, you know, that strength. Because I see that eroding today. Yeah, big time. You know, and I, I see hope. It's like there's someone behind the scenes that right now has a big eraser and they're trying to erase hope. Yeah. And, you know, what, what happens if I take your hope away? What happens to Rick? I turn in. There's no light coming back at me. Yep. I don't, I don't think about tomorrow. I think about what am I going to do in the next 15 minutes? So I, I turn from someone who is focused to someone who's surviving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, survivors need someone to throw them a life ring. Mm -hmm. And so many times the people who throw the life ring, they put conditions on the life ring. Yeah, big time. No, you're, you're a person, you, you're a person that has a presence in my life. You're someone I've always respected just because of what you were willing to stand up and do and just in conclusion here tell them what you told me about when you went back to the mayo clinic after <laughs> well i yeah i i did i wasn't going to put that on there because i think the mayo clinic has probably helped a lot of people i wasn't one of them. but the chemotherapist was a fair guy I've, I've pointed that out in fact he sort of bon voyage me when i walked out of the room the surgeon, not so much. So when I got back to Minnesota, I called him up and I said, well, I'm back from my treatment. I'd like to come in and get your opinion and maybe check me out and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so he agreed. And I walked into his office when he saw me come through the door of his office. He looked at me and I was 20 pounds heavier. I had a suntan because I'd been in Mexico for a month. And he went, 
like stop. And I did. I, door closed behind me. I stopped. He said, before we have this discussion, I want you to know that nothing you did in Tijuana could have had anything to do with this apparent recovery of yours. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Doc, you look like a bright guy, but I've been wrong before. And if you were really a healer, if you were really a physician, you would have looked at me and went, come on in. What did you do? And you would have been taking notes. But you don't care what I did because you have a narrative. You have a presupposition that you're already right. So no point. And he said, this discussion is over. I turned around and walked out. I've never spoken to him again. Never been back. Too bad, huh? Ideas have legs, good and bad ones. And when it's a good idea, it's too bad that sometimes people just close themselves off and they can't do it. Where I think you and I are, have the personality of going, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> It's not like we get swept into all this stuff, but we're at least willing to hear what somebody has to say because, you know, there are guys like that lived like um, Tesla, you know, Nikola Tesla and Einstein and these people that buck the system and turn out to be, for the most part, right. If you think about it, they offer people hope. And, and that's our word. That's, that's the word. Mm -hmm. Because we've got to get back to presenting people with hope. Because I think a huge part of personal motivation is having hope. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for spending this time uh, with us today. And um, the difference. And one more time, your email address is rbhill48. That's it at gmail. Gmail.com. Yeah. Okay. Folks, I hope you've gained a lot from listening to, to Rick. I think his story is very powerful. And I think it's a, it really is a story about desire, about determination, and about discipline. And it really is a story about living your life from the inside out, not the outside in, and not letting other people write the script for your life, but doing what you feel is right for you. That's right. what it's all about. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll see you again on our next episode of Let's Talk Human Behavior. And once again, Rick, thank you very much. You're welcome, Richard. Thank you.